I'm Natalie Weiss, one of your co-chairs for the SMA's Physicians and Training Leadership Working Group. I'm here today to introduce our lovely, esteemed speaker, Ms. Rebecca Fabian. Ms. Fabian is a fourth year student at Tulane University School of Medicine and is our group's new chair of mentoring and networking. And in the spirit of networking and mentorship, she is presenting today to give some guidance to students who will be in her position in the future. Without further ado, here's Ms. Rebecca Fabian and a day in the life of an MS4 in general surgery. Hi, Natalie. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. I need to add, add those quotes to my resume, you know, build it <laughs> up a little bit. Um, I appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me and letting me speak today just about kind of my experience and where I'm at in the process right now. So we'll get started. I have a couple of slides for those of you that are watching this, for those of you that are just listening, that is completely okay. And I will be talking through the whole thing too. So today I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, kind of my background, what has, um, brought me to this point right now. My journey, once I got into medical school, kind of from the first day of first year to where I am now. And then I'm gonna take you through what a general day looks like, specifically for me when I was on my sub-internship or acting internship um, on our acute care service at Tulane. And then I'm just gonna leave you all with a couple of key points, tips, thoughts, and I'm going to try to make this whole presentation kind of applicable to all levels and all people throughout their training. So whether you're a pre-medical student, a medical student at any point in the four years, or even residents and beyond um, to kind of look back and reflect on the medical students in this process where it's at today. So a little bit about myself, I moved around a whole lot as a kid, but kind of ended up making home growing up in the suburbs of Seattle, Washington, um, where my family still is today. Um, I went to the University of Michigan for my undergraduate training. I majored in BCN, which was biopsychology, cognition and neuroscience. And that was really kind of the, the start of when I was like, maybe I am a scientist, maybe I am okay at this medicine thing. I took one year in between undergraduate and starting medical school where I worked in New York for a year, kind of doing a little bit of everything. I was actually the general manager of a gym. I worked in molecular diagnostics for a little bit. So kind of tried to dabble in a lot of different things. And I think that that really was a unique experience that kind of gave me a lot of background um, diversity in what I could, um, like skills I was able to obtain, but it also made me 110% sure medicine was the right field for me because no matter what I tried, nothing quite gave me that little butterfly in my stomach and that excitement like when I walked into a hospital. Um, so I ended up choosing Tulane to do my medical school training. It's been a wonderful three plus years and I am currently applying for a general surgery residency. So we will see where that process takes me. Um, some interests about myself. I am very active when I'm not in the hospital or at a desk studying, I will be outside. You can find me anywhere. I will be running. I'm a spin instructor. I love to travel. And fun fact about myself, I like bull riding. How that happened in formed is a whole story in and of itself that we can definitely talk about another time. Um, and this picture here is me with my favorite animal, a hippo. So a little bit about my time through medical school. 
I walked in on the first day of my first year of medical school. If you're watching this, you can see the picture on the left here. It's scary and it's something that I had always considered medicine um, since I was a little girl. And when you finally get there, you, it's it's a little nerve wracking. You the the field once you're in it doesn't doesn't seem isn't what it seems like from the outside. Um and you know, I kind of just jumped right into it. Um first year was it was a rude awakening. You know, you're always told as a medical student, oh, just wait for med school when you're with the best of the best. And you were the smartest in high school, the smartest in college, and now you won't be. And while that is true, I think it was, it's a great opportunity to be with some of the best, brightest, most innovative people in the country and believe it, you are one of them. It might not always seem like it. It definitely didn't for me. I know that uh, the first couple of months I struggled and not because I felt inferior to my colleagues and my peers, but really it's just this whole new style of learning. I got through all of my high school, college, um, kind of fairly easily. Um, I've studied, I worked hard. I definitely had classes that were harder than others. Um, but medical school, it wasn't just reading the slides anymore. It wasn't just highlighting the textbook. It's a whole nother level of complexity and understanding. That took me a long time to realize, really up until my third year, to kind of adapt to. Um, and so it's hard and it's, it's a new lifestyle. Um, the first, how Tulane's curriculum works, the first and second year of med school is more didactic based. You are um, learning from lectures, from peer groups. We have um, team-based learning, problem-based learning, where you're working with your classmates to um, understand the body, the organ systems, what is right and what can go wrong. Um, and that was a really helpful two years to kind of establish your foundation, really make sure I knew kind of what was going on. But I always had that urge to get into the hospital and you see the third and fourth years and they're walking around in their white coats and um, bags under their eyes. And I was so jealous of those bags under their eyes because um, they were doing something. And that was really when I started having an idea of maybe I want to pursue a specialty where I am doing something because sitting and while I love to learn, and I think anyone in this field, the unspoken requirement is that you love to learn. Um, I realized I was envious of the long hours. I was envious of the fatigue that some of these, they would walk in in their scrubs after a surgery, the third years and the fourth years, and I wanted that. And so I kind of seeked it out. I looked for mentors. I looked for preceptors that took me on and let me, as a near first, second year medical student, really get involved. And, um, something about my personality. I am the one that gets right in there and has no fear. So when someone says go, I go. And um, I was able to watch a, a ton of surgeries. I was able to go and help out in the clinics as a first year, a second year. And I loved it. And from that point on, it was kind of no turning back. I came into medical school originally thinking I wanted to do pediatrics. And while I loved pediatrics, it was a great rotation. Um, nothing really gave me that feeling of I'm a doctor. I am doing something to help this person right here, right now for the long term. That's what I felt from surgery. And it's not to say any other field doesn't give you that feeling. I think everyone has that, that little butterfly moment. 
for what they're supposed to do. And so here I am today, maybe, maybe not quite as scared as that picture of me um, at my white coat ceremony, maybe 10 times more afraid because it's real now um, and it's happening and it's exciting. And from there, I'm going to kind of walk through what a day in the life of a fourth year in surgery is like. Um, surgery historically gets kind of a bad rep for early, early, early mornings, sometimes late nights, cranky surgeons that yell a lot and throw tools across the OR, um, mean scrub techs. And I can tell you right now, well, some of those are true. The mornings are early, the days are busy and full. Things have changed quite a bit now. You're not getting angry, cranky, moody people any more than you would anywhere else. Um, and it really was a great month. This is me, uh, if you're watching this, this picture, I took, I was able to work a 36 hour overnight call um, over on one of my weekends on, on service. And this was taken at about, I wanna say 2 a.m. Um, I was walking down the halls of the hospital and it was this cr crazy reflection and it really just made me stop and reflect. And this was the moment where I was like, I'm doing this, I am here, I am in this amazing city looking out onto all of the hospitals, all of the people I'm here treating. And in the reflection, you could see the hospital behind me. And I just thought that was kind of really a culminating defining moment right there. So what does my day look like? Um, around 4 a.m., I would get to the hospital, how the acute care surgery team at Tulane works is, this service is kind of your, your in-between um, patients. So it's not a mass trauma activation where they're coming in from a huge motor vehicle accident or gunshot wounds. Um, they're not quite at that level, but it's not an elective outpatient type surgery. These are your gallbladder removals, appendicitis, um, bowel obstructions, stuff like that. Um, so our list any, on any given day could range from about eight patients upwards of 20 plus. And um, my job was to make sure the list of patients, uh, what room they were in, what medications they were on, any past medical history, um, any notes of things that happened overnight or things that we needed to remember to do that day, that all had to be updated and ready for all of our patients. And while this seems like, you know, scut work or that kind of job no one wants to do, it was a lot and it was early in the morning I had to do this, but I really felt that this time more than any other time during the day was what allowed me to get to know the patients and really have the, that valuable information that made me a, a really valuable resource to the team. And I ended up realizing I knew more about these patients than I, than I thought, because during the day it gets so busy, things get away from you. And when your chief resident looks back and is like, oh shoot, what was their white blood cell count at 2 p.m.? I knew it. And I knew that they had just had an operation. I knew, I knew all of this information about so many patients. Um, around 6.30 in the morning, uh, the chief, the mid-level, the interns would all get together and we would round on our, all of our patients. Um, that was one thing that I think I took away more than anything from this, this month was Take all the information you can get from people, but at the end of the day, confirm for yourself. And if you don't lay eyes on your patient, if you don't examine them yourself, if you don't ask them those questions yourself, you can never be sure it's accurate. And that's where a lot of 
missteps and mistakes happen in the medical system is people taking information and just rewriting it and rewriting it and rewriting it. And it's dangerous and it can add up and spiral. And so it's easy, an easy thing to do. Just go verify always. Um, first start surgeries at Tulane are usually around 7.30. So around 7 a.m., we would go to the pre-op area, go to the patient patient's room that we were gonna do first, wherever they were, make sure everything was ready to go for surgery uh, so that we could roll down. Anesthesia would start right around 7.30 normally on a good day. And depending on the procedure would finish it's usually a couple of hours, even for the most basic of procedures. Um, so we would finish around, you know, 9, 9.30, 10. Uh, once the case finished, the attending would come in, uh, meet us in the post-op area, wherever we were, finish rounding on all of the patients that we had seen in the morning with the attending, finalize our plans, finalize what we wanted to do that day. And then from there on out, it was kind of a hodgepodge of what we did. The acute care surgery service for, I loved about it, what some people get frightened about it is you never know what's coming. You could have nothing, 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 and then you have three people with appendicitis come in and you have to be ready and you have to be there for them. So when you have downtime, you're getting your notes done. You're helping uh, with floor work, making sure that everyone's medications are being administered correctly. The pager, one of the interns usually holds and that was how I knew I was gaining trust as a medical student is ultimately I was allowed to hold the pager sometimes and tell the, tell the intern, hey, we got this page. Um, I think we need to go to the ER and see a consult. And little things like that as a medical student might seem insignificant at first or might seem really, really like a big deal at first. Um, but it's kind of that graduated autonomy that residents have. You kind of get that too. And it's fun to see yourself progress and learn more and more of how the service works. Um, if there were any more cases, we would also go do those as, as we were able to. Around five o'clock is when the night float team would come in and we would sign out the patients to the night team. That was another really great experience for me. I got to do the sign out a couple of times and it really helps me as a student synthesize and be kind of remember, remind myself, do I really know what's going on? Do I really understand what we did that day? Because I think as a medical student, it's really easy to get lost in what's happening with your patient because we, while we care for them and we're involved in their care, we aren't the ones that are signing our names. We oftentimes can't put in the orders, can't write and sign the notes. So these little details get lost in a medical student's mind and that's valid, that's okay. But being able to do that sign out allowed me to reflect back and, and know every single thing that happened that day. Um, so that was a really seemingly easy thing to do that turned out to not be very easy, but was really important. And then from then on out, we had to finish whatever work needed to be done from that day. So if we got flooded with consults and had three people still waiting, we had to finish seeing them. And I would usually get home anywhere between six and eight on any given day. So the days are long, the days are busy, but I found them to be so rewarding. And even though I had some of the least amount of sleep this month, I've never been happier. I've never been more fulfilled and felt like I was really contributing something, which I think is really special. So you all heard a little bit about me and my process through, through medicine so far. While I'm just one student, 
and what I say is not law, it's just my experience. I do think that over the past four plus years, um, I've really had some, some good take home messages, sometimes from trial and error on myself, sometimes trial and error of my peers. Um, and sometimes they're just really good lessons that have stuck with me through it all. So I wanted to share kind of the top 10 things that I think really will go a long way for anyone. This is for pre-medical students. This is for medical students. This is even for residents. Um, some ten, the top 10 things that I think need to be said. First and foremost, write it down. It seems at the time, like you'll remember everything. You're sitting there talking with your attending and they say to do, you know, X, Y, and Z, go change this medicate, go change the, um, metoprolol to levetalol, you know, something easy like that, increase the dosage. You're like, I got this. I got this. I'll, I'll, I'll remember. So much can happen in the blink of an eye in the hospital and you'll forget. Just write it down. Even if it seems like it's taking forever and you feel silly doing it, you're like, this is so minute. I don't need to write it down. Just write it down. It will never hurt you in the long run. Um, number two, don't lie or make something up. I remember when someone first told me this piece of advice, I thought they were crazy. I was like, of course, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going, how could you make up something about a patient? Well, when you are face to face with that attending and they're like, did you check their urine output? And you're like, crap, I did everything under the sun for this patient. I wrote down everything, but I forgot to check their urine output. And you realize you made a mistake and you realize you, you forgot something. It's okay. We all do it. It happens to everyone. And it's better to admit it than to make something up. If you say, oh yeah, their, their urine output was fine. Or Oh, um, I think it was like a hundred. Just, just say, I'm sorry. I didn't check. No harm done. Um, seems simple, but easier said than done sometimes. Number three, you don't have to conform to the stereotypes or do something because other people did it to you. What does this mean exactly? I saw throughout third year people that realized they really liked a specialty. Let's say someone really likes surgery. Well, surgeons are supposed to be mean and curt and kind of short and they just tell it how it is. And all of a sudden people would start being the surgeon stereotype. And, and I'm like, you're a really nice person. You smile all the time. You're really friendly. Just because a surgeon is supposed to be serious and short, that, it, that doesn't mean you have to act like that. And likewise, there's residents that sometimes are like, well, when I was a medical student, I was forced to stay late into the night and I did this and this and this. And because I had to do that as a medical student, I wanna make sure you guys do that too. If it's helpful and you think that it really benefited you and benefited the team, by all means, do it. But at the same time, that's sometimes what's wrong with the medical system is that idea of, well, I had it done to me, so I'm going to propagate it and do it to others. And that does not need to happen. If something, if we experience something that did not help us or did not better the team, don't do it in the future. Make note of that. Make note of what not to do and try to better the system, better the experience for everyone involved. Be a team player. What I mean by this is for the medical students, for the interns, um, for the pre-meds, people notice you getting along. People notice you helping the team. People notice you contributing to the greater good. It never is going to help you or the team to throw someone under the bus or to 
cut someone off in the middle of their sentence because you think you have a better answer and you think that that will get you noticed more. Um, people notice you not being a team player. And so really just be nice. At the end of the day, just be nice. It's going to mean so much more than you being the best student on the team. Number five, treat each patient or rotation like it's your family. And what I mean by this is treat everyone with respect, treat everyone with the care they deserve. It's really easy when it's eight o'clock at night and you've been at the hospital for 17 hours and you're tired and you just want to go home and you get a call and it's your patient saying, my stomach hurts or I'm nauseous. And you're like, oh my gosh, they're fine. No, if, you're, if your mom was in the hospital or your sister, your brother, your dad, and it's eight o'clock at night and their stomach hurt, you would want that doctor to come see them. Likewise, if it's a rotation, you're like, I really don't like neurology. Neurologists are great, just using it as an example. But um, I really don't like neurology. I really don't like the brain. I don't wanna deal with stroke patients. I don't wanna do this rotation. Well, this, first of all, this is the only time you're ever going to get to do all of these rotations. You will never get this experience again. So that right there is an opportunity unlike any other. And these are still your patients. Even though you don't like neurology or you don't like OBGYN or you don't like surgery, people still need you. And these are still OBGYN, neurology, surgery patients that need help. So just treat them well. Always introduce yourself. This seems silly, but in a hospital, there are so many moving parts always. Um, and people change daily, hourly. And it seems kind of silly, but whenever you approach someone, just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm a medical student. Um, I'm with the surgery team. It seems silly and they might be like, I don't care. Or they might say, okay, but it is always good to introduce yourself because a lot of the time I've done this too. You'll approach someone and I'm like, I don't care if they really know who I am. I just have to, I'm supposed to relay a message and I get through my whole spiel. They're like, well, who are you? And they, I realized I haven't listened to a thing I said because they just don't know who I am. So just introduce yourself. Keep bars in your pocket. Don't put them in your bag. Sometimes you won't get to back to your bag for five hours and you're really hungry. Keep bars in your pocket. It prevents the hangriness, those Snickers commercials that, that where people get hungry and mean, it happens. Number eight, just go with it. Thing, weird things happen sometimes and things do not go according to plan. As we have realized with 2020 in general, I think if anything, 2020 has been a great example of just go with it. Things don't go according to plan. Sometimes you mess up. Sometimes you get things right you didn't expect to get right. Just go with it. Smile, nod, get better at what you can get better, acknowledge what happened, and keep going. Coffee is key. That one's for myself. I learned that about myself. I, I'm not addicted to caffeine. I just really, really, really enjoy it. We'll go with that. Um, and then this wouldn't be a surgery talk if I didn't end with the golden rule of surgery, and that is eat when you can, sleep when you can, and don't mess with the pancreas. So to kind of sum up, that is a little bit about myself. That's a little bit about my experience so far in my, albeit short, it seems long, but probably in the grand scheme of things, short four-ish years of medical school. And lessons I've learned and wanted to share with you so that hopefully you all can have a little bit of an easier time with your journey in the future. And so Natalie, thank you for having me. Thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to speak with everyone. And if there's any questions you have on behalf of the SMA, I'm happy to answer anything. Absolutely. I've got 
quite a few questions that I'd love to ask you right now. I'm so curious. Um, and thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I think that everyone will learn quite a bit from your experience. Good. So I wanted to start off with, um, you know, you talked a lot about your, your trip from pre-med to first year to fourth year and how you've grown so much. If you could talk to your pre-med self, are there some pro tips that you might give for, for them, maybe applying or their attitude or things like that? Yeah, if I had to look back and kind of talk to my pre-med self, I think the number one thing is to tell myself, just keep going. Um, this whole process, it's a marathon. It's not a 5K, it's not a half marathon. It's an Ironman and um, it's hard and you're, you'll have good miles, you'll have bad miles. Um, I talk about that with my family all the time. You know, I'll have a bad day or a bad month or bad exam and, and you know, they'll be like, Beck, this just, this was a hard mile for you. This was an uphill part of that marathon. Um, you'll get to the downhill part of it eventually. So if I had to look back at myself, just knowing that it's okay to struggle and it's okay to have ups and downs and this path does not it seems like everyone else around you is handling it beautifully and that you shouldn't be struggling and you shouldn't be working hard and you feel like you're always scrambling and treading like barely treading water and that's okay and just keep your head up and it's hard, but put a smile on your face and keep going sometimes one day at a time and it will be okay and you'll get there. And I even am telling myself this now throughout this residency application. Um, it's terrifying and each day is a new day and you don't know what it brings and it's scary, but beautiful. So really just keep, keep persevering. If it doesn't happen on the first time to the pre-meds, if you don't get in, that's the new norm it is and it's hard but keep at it because you can do it it always seems like those transition periods are just the most full of uncertainty the most difficult and mentally trying oh it's horrible <laughs> um so you said that you really seem to have a good time at tulane um it's it's got a pretty good reputation i'd say um and I wanted to ask, how did you decide on Tulane? Um, and yeah. how are you deciding on which residency you want to pick as well? So I applied to quite a few schools for med school. Um, I don't remember what the exact number was. I got interviews at a couple. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, I really felt that Tulane, here, I can stop sharing my screen. So, okay, there we go, that might be a little bit better. I really felt that Tulane, um, above all other schools that I had interviewed at, gave me the opportunity to keep being me. And what I mean by that is time and time again during that interview process, they, asked me, what do I enjoy? What, what do I think makes me me? You know, we're all here to be doctors. We're all here to learn. We're all here to develop our skills as a professional. But what gets lost a lot of the time is we're still people. We're still young adults that are discovering ourselves as individuals. And Tulane, I thought, did an amazing job and have stayed true to this throughout the four years so far um, of really m making an important point to keep doing what makes us us. And everyone attending Tulane was picked for a reason because we are, we're special and it sometimes doesn't seem like it, but we are. Um, everyone out there, everyone out there is special. Every single person out there has something unique about them. And Tulane let me do that and let me grow as 
not just a med student, but as a person. And so that's really something I'm continuing to take with me through my residency search is I want to find a program that not, of course, is going to train me to be the best surgeon possible. Of course, that's important. And I have no doubt that I will end up at a program that will make me a great surgeon and a great doctor. But I also think it's important, especially in a surgery residency, you spend so many hours there that your co-residents become your family, your upper levels become your big brothers and big sisters, your attendings become your kind of supplemental parents. And I really want a program that becomes that family for me and allows me to keep being me. That sounds really ideal. Um. <laughs> Dare to dream maybe, but I'll live <laughs> in my, my ignorance for now. <laughs> oh, I think that they exist. Um, <laughs> so kind of following with that, do you feel like you've had time to maintain your hobbies and interests throughout medical school? Absolutely. Um, sometimes easier than other times, but um, I really do think that something I pride myself the most on is how I have been able to continue doing what I love and really discover what I love. Um, my first year of med school, I came in thinking, okay, this is it. I was a swimmer all through school. Uh, swimming was my big thing. Picked up running a little bit once. I couldn't always have access to a pool. Um, and I was like, well, that's, that's that. I'm in med school now. There's no time for fun. And I quickly learned that there was. And I kind of dabbled in things here and there. I became involved in Tulane's fitness and medicine program. And um, New Orleans has a group called uh, November Project, and that's, it's throughout the nation, a free fitness group. So I was able to meet new people through fitness um, within Tulane and within the New Orleans community itself. And that really gave me the courage to, to continue doing this. And I ultimately ended up completing, during my three plus years now, I've completed numerous 5Ks, a half marathon, a full marathon, I got certified to teach spin and I'm now a spin instructor. COVID put a little bit of a damper on it, but, um, and I, you know, I do things besides running, swimming, biking too. But for me, that really illustrates the fact that you can do it. And yes, there were times that in order to do what I loved, I knew that I would have a stressful day and that was kind of, my run was my release. So maybe I had to get up a, an hour earlier or go to bed an hour later than I otherwise would have. But I think at the end of the day, it really, really makes it worth it to do what you love. And for you, maybe it's music, maybe it's painting, maybe it's skateboarding, but finding even 20 minutes in a day to do what you love, it's possible. I promise it's possible. And it makes such a big difference. You said running, swimming, biking. What about the bull riding? <laughs> I know, right? I need to need to lace up my cowgirl boots for that. <laughs> Did you start doing that during medical school? Uh, bull riding? Mm -hmm. I don't ride the bulls. I oh. was not allowed to do that. Um, I'm a fan of watching it. So oh. fun fact, um, you know, there's like the fantasy football out there and fantasy baseball. There's a fantasy bull riding. And throughout the, throughout the nation, through the professional bull riders. And when I was a junior in college, when I was 16, I won it. And wow. <laughs> uh, throughout the country. And, you know, I, every week I had to pick the five best riders and the five best bulls. And throughout the year, I consistently picked, picked the best. And so I got, I w got to go to Las Vegas for the world finals as a 16 year old. Didn't enjoy Las Vegas to its fullest potential. Apparently I was happy at the time. Uh, I got cowgirl boots. I would, it, it was fun. Wow. <laughs> Quite a shift fun, going fun from fact. that to. <laughs> All right. 
Um, so having having said all of these things about medical school and re residency applications, do you think that you would do it again? Or are you are you glad that you pursued medicine? Absolutely, <laughs> in one word. Um, I think that medicine is such a selfless and yet rewarding career and it was not at all how I expected it to be to be completely honest you know you see the tv you see scrubs actually is fairly lifelike actually but you know you see the resident and um Grey's Anatomy whatever you see those tv shows growing up and even as a patient you go in and you see this what seems like a well-oiled machine just where these doctors are so fine-tuned and um, everyone knows their role and it's not necessarily always like that I think it oftentimes is but it's not how Hollywood depicts it for sure so it definitely is different um, and I definitely have worked really hard to get to where I am now um, have had good days have had bad days but at the end of the day I like I said, I still, every time I walk into that hospital, I get that butterfly feeling in my stomach and I leave and I'm like, wow, I just, even as a, a medical student, I just made a difference here. I went in there and helped change somebody's life, um, hopefully for the better. And I think that through all the struggles, through all the work, through all the stress, it is 110% worth it. And I'm so excited to keep pursuing this and continuing this journey and really making an impact on not just surgery, but medicine in general. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Rebecca Fabian. I've really enjoyed hearing your story today. And with that, we reached the end of our day in the life presentation for today. Thank you everyone for keeping up with the physicians and training educational materials. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of resources out there. And you have chosen to listen to this one. For that, you have all of our appreciation. If you've enjoyed this presentation, Please like, share with your friends. I'm sure it'll spark some great discussion. And if you didn't enjoy it, you can submit complaints at www.com. <laughs> Please visit sma.org for more information on our organization, become a member of the SMA Physicians and Training Group, or follow us on Facebook. Until next time, everyone, thank you for coming. Thanks, everyone.